Good morning, everybody. This is audio test. Uh, this is Chris from Grand Challenges Canada. Audio test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I hope you've adjusted your speakers clearly. Um, the, the call is starting. We will just give a few minutes for those that are joining us late. Um, welcome, Chris. It's great to have you on the call. Uh, we know that people had to download a, a plugin to get in, and so that may have taken people a few minutes. So, so we'll just give a few minutes to those that may have slower internet connections before we begin. You won't see us on video today. Um, you'll see our slides. The call is being recorded, so anybody who missed a session will have a chance to view it afterwards. So we're just going to wait a few minutes. For those to join who had to download the plugin, thank you to those that submitted questions in advance. If you have any questions, you can ask them throughout the call and we'll try our best to get to them. We don't guarantee. Good to, have, good to see you joining us from Rwanda. Welcome. Thank you. We'll start in a few minutes, but uh, I'll answer Patrick's question. How many grants are there? There will probably be uh, this year between 15 and 20 grants of up to a quarter of a million dollars and either zero or one or two larger grants of up to one million. Welcome, Tom. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to, to Patrick to officially start the call. Hi everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Patrick Coburn, I'm the program coordinator for the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. Um, just to, to inform you that this uh, this call is being recorded um, and it will be posted on, on our website shortly after the call. Um, in terms of uh, the Q&A section of the call um, at the end, um, we have received some questions in advance as Chris said, so thank you very much for that. We'll be um, responding to a select few of those um, and we, we will respond to all questions by email um, if we don't get to them in this call. Um, at the end, we'll also take questions and, and aim to answer them. We ask that uh, you, you keep the questions uh, general so it's applicable to everybody on the call. Um, any kind of more specific questions to your innovation, we're, we're not able to, to provide direct guidance regarding your innovation. Um, so please try and keep your, your questions general. Um, so now I'll, I'll hand it back over to Chris. Thank you, Patrick. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are. We, we chose this time in order that uh, those in the Middle East, those in Europe, those in Africa and other zones uh, could join. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to call in. My name is Chris Houston. I'm the Senior Program Officer for Creating Hope and Conflict. A humanitarian grand challenge. This challenge is a partnership of the United States Agency um, for International Development, the United Kingdom Department for International Development and Grand Challenges Canada. I'm a Grand Challenges Canada employee and we're, we're broadcasting from Grand Challenges Canada office here in Toronto. So together we seek life-saving or life-improving innovations to help the most vulnerable and hardest to reach people impacted by humanitarian crises caused by conflict. By way of background, it might be helpful for you to know that prior to running the Humanitarian Grand Challenge, I worked for Medicine Sans Frontieres, Doctors Without Borders in Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Turkey and Pakistan. And I worked for the Canadian Red Cross in Nepal and Lebanon. And I spent six months last year as head of logistics and operational support for the World Health Organization. Thank you for your interest in applying or for considering applying. Today, we're going to share some helpful, I hope, background information on the Grand Challenge, on, on Grand Challenges Canada, 
um, and some additional information about the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. And of course, some specific information about the next steps for yourselves or your project as you get started with your application. First, I would like to, I would like to introduce the various members of the team who are on the call with us today. Um, so I'm Chris Houston, the Senior Programs Officer. I'm Patrick Caribbean, the Program Coordinator. I'm Natalie Boychuk, the Humanitarian Research Assistant. And I'm Ken Tong, I'm the Communication Specialist. And uh, Joe Torres, our Director of Operations, will join us towards the end of the call. We'll help Ken out. So, hey everyone. So, um, I'd just like to, to give a, an overview of what we're going to be speaking about on the call today. Um, we want to allow plenty of time to answer you, the pre-submitted questions and questions that you, you might have that come up um, over the course of the call. The first item on the agenda is to give background and, and really the purpose of this humanitarian Grand Challenge. Secondly, we're going to give a brief overview of Grand Challenges Canada. Thirdly, we're going to um, give an overview of the evaluation criteria that um, applications will be um, judged on. Fourth, we're going to look at the application process and timeline. And then um, we're going to respond to the, to the questions that were submitted in advance, and then we'll move to the, the Q&A, um, the live session. So to uh, help us keep on time, we'll start with a, a brief overview of the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. Thank you, Patrick. So hi, this is Chris, the Senior Programs Officer for the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. I'm going to talk a little bit about the events that led up to, to where we are today. What happened was we started with a, a very wide consultative effort. Um, we went through a, a process called the Delphi process and we consulted with people affected by humanitarian crisis, with innovators, with United Nations agencies, with NGOs, humanitarian agencies. And we went through a process to create a top 10 list of humanitarian needs in the world. I then spent many months discussing primarily with people affected by humanitarian crisis to decide on the focus area for this humanitarian grand challenge. I'll also tell you some observations that we made along the way. Um, if you look at the slide that I'm sharing just now, it's a screen grab of the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs website that I, that I grabbed this morning. And you can see, um, as, as, as it has been for some months now, the top three emergencies. Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria and Yemen. And, and what these three emergencies have in common is that they are all man-made disasters and they're all conflict related. Also, what you'll see is that if you go to that website and follow through, that they are all underfunded. Um, if you go to the website, you'll see that Democratic Republic of Congo is 6.4% funded. Syria is only 21.4% funded. And Yemen is only 9.9% .9 funded. In Yemen right now, there are $3 billion worth of needs and a $2.7 billion funding gap. Also, what we noticed was that a lot of the funding goes to international agencies and that national and local, local agencies get a tiny fraction. In fact, in, in 2014, it was 0.4% of the overall funding envelope that went directly to national and local agencies and 99.6% went directly to international agencies. Many humanitarians talk about how they are struggling to gain access to the areas that we're talking about. But the reality is that in Syria, Syrian responders do have access and that Yemen, Yemeni responders do have access. But it's the outsiders that don't have access and the international agencies that, that, that struggle. Just to be clear, um, our intention is to focus on conflict zones and people affected by conflict. We've given the, the top three examples there, but it's, there, there's, there's not a limited list of conflicts 
that we're willing to support. Um, it's up to the innovator to convince us in their proposal that the context they have chosen uh, meets the, the needs of the humanitarian grand challenge. So let me give you a brief summary of the humanitarian grand challenge. Through this first call for innovations, we seek life-saving or life-improving innovations to help the most vulnerable and hardest to reach people impacted by humanitarian crisis caused by conflict. These innovations will engage with the private sector and involve input from affected communities in order to provide, supply, or locally generate clean water and sanitation, energy, life-saving information, or health supplies and services to help conflict-affected people. The deadline for submission is the 12th of April. And you can get the information that we're sharing today in this webinar and all information about the challenge on the website. You can see that on your screen right now, www.humanitariangrandchallenge.org. So who do we seek to assist? We want to help people and we want to and we seek innovations that focus on people who are particularly vulnerable in conflict affected humanitarian crisis. It's not a comprehensive list, but it includes people that are vulnerable due to their gender, their sexuality, their religion, their age, their income, people with disabilities, people with chronic health conditions, people who are stateless, minorities people who are unable to evacuate. I mentioned them earlier, but I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about the four focus areas that we would like to hear about. The first one is safe water and sanitation. We are looking for bold ideas, technologies, processes and approaches that enable rapid provision of safe water and safe disposal of waste and sewage in the most vulnerable households or enable implementers to rapidly scale up their programs. In terms of energy, we're looking for bold ideas to generate energy. We're particularly interested in alternative energy solutions that are possible to set up and maintain in conflict situations. And systems that power life-saving or life-improving services, for example, health, information, water, sanitation, or education. The next area is life-saving information. We're looking for bold ideas that use and improve access to information and data to increase the impact of humanitarian assistance at a local level, as well as enabling more effective connections between affected populations and humanitarian actors. And finally, but also importantly, health products and services. We're looking for bold ideas that enable more individuals to provide quality care, to empower skilled staff who choose to work in these conflict zones and to allow, allow faster or less costly importation and distribution of quality essential health supplies in conflict zones and enable communities to manufacture necessary high quality and safe supplies or sterilize and reuse them. Next, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about Grand Challenges Canada. Um, all of us in the room are employees of, of, of Grand Challenges Canada and we are administering the humanitarian Grand Challenge funded by the two partners I mentioned earlier, USAID and, and DFID. But Grand Challenges Canada, we're an independent, not-for-profit corporation, similar in structure to a foundation. Grand Challenges Canada is one of the largest impact first investors in Canada. And with a feminist investment approach, Grand Challenges Canada has supported a pipeline of over 800 innovations in more than 80 countries. Grand Challenges Canada estimates that these innovations have the potential to save up to 1 million lives and improve up to 28 million lives by 2030. We're hosted here in Toronto at the University Health Network. Next, uh, I'm going to pass you back to Patrick. Going to talk about the evaluation criteria. This is important for people who are applying to understand how we will look at the proposals. So I pass the microphone. Thank you very much. 
Chris. Um, so before I go into the uh, the areas of, of the evaluation criteria, I'd just like to give a, a brief overview of the, the review process itself. Um, there are several steps to the review process, like the application and the transition to scale um, letter of intent. Um, so the first step is that um, all applications will undergo an eligibility screen. Now at this point, we're looking to see if applications are, are complete in full. Um, we can't accept any um, applications that are incomplete. We'll also be looking at whether the institution is, is eligible. Um, for example, we can only fund legally registered um, entities. We can't fund individuals directly. Um, we're also looking at um, project leads names because we can only um, accept a project lead on, on one application. So an individual cannot submit multiple applications as, as a project lead. And finally, we're looking to see that the, the applications are in English because we're only able to receive them in English. The second step is what we call an innovation screen. Um, so all those eligible applications are screened under two categories. One, is it innovative? And two, is it relevant to the challenge? So we're looking to see if the idea is novel and that it's aligned with the challenge statement in the, in the request for proposals and that it aligns with, with at least one of the four areas of focus. Following the innovation screen, those that, that are successful and, and move to the next step will undergo an independent review. So this step, step of the, uh, the review process um, involves um, external um, independent um, experts in the field who will be scoring applications that, that have made it through um, the innovation screen and they'll be scoring them on the following criteria. The first criteria is impact. So for seed applications, reviewers will be looking at the extent to which the proposals have the potential to generate life-saving or life-improving assistance for vulnerable people in conflict. For transition to scale, reviewers will also be looking at the proof of concept for the proposed solution. For both funding streams, reviewers will ask themselves whether the proposed solution is appropriate for wider implementation in conflict settings. And for, also for both streams, the reviewers will be looking at whether the proposed idea applies to the most vulnerable and has the potential to address inequality. The next review criteria is integrated innovation. Reviewers will assess proposals on whether they are, again, whether they are bold and novel and something new, whether they integrate scientific or technological, social and business innovation. And you can see in the request for proposals, there is a, a further definition of what we mean by integrated innovation. And then reviewers will look at have the applicants meaningfully engage affected people in the designing, testing and iterating of the proposed innovation. The next evaluation criteria is the project execution plan. For SEED, reviewers will determine whether the project execution plan is appropriately designed to demonstrate proof of concept of the idea within the time and resources provided. For transition to scale, reviewers will assess the proposed plan for scale and sustainability, and that includes commitment from key stakeholders and partners. For both seed and transition to scale, reviewers will also be looking at the connection to private sector, the strength of the monitoring and evaluation plan, the consideration of gender, environment, human rights and inclusion, and will be looking at risk mitigation strategies. The final evaluation criteria is looking at the leadership capability to champion change. Here the reviewers will be looking at whether the project lead and the key team members are appropriately trained, experienced and positioned to carry out the proposed work. They will also look at the extent to which the team has demonstrated the ability to draw on the expertise of the private sector. And finally, they will look at whether the team has demonstrated their ability to understand and to meet the needs of affected people in the context. So now I'd like to move um, and hand it over to Natalie, who's going to tell you about how and when to apply. So we are currently accepting seed and transition applications until Thursday, April 12th, 2018 at 11.30 a.m. North American Eastern Time Zone. We anticipate uh, having another submission opportunity in approximately early 2019. There is no limit on how many applications an organization can submit. 
but each proposal must have a project lead and each person can only lead one proposal. Now we'd like to review the process of how to apply for funding. All applications must be submitted via our online portal called Flux. Applicants must first create an account using the link under application instructions on our website. Please allow one business day for us to process your account request. Once your account has been created, you will be notified via email and can then log into the portal to access the application forms. Select seed or transition to scale forms depending on the stage that your innovation is at, and you can refer again to the evaluation criteria in the RFP. All applications must be submitted in English. You can save your work and return to your application at any time, but please be sure to click the save button at the end of each session and regularly in areas with poor internet connectivity. When you've completed the form and are ready to submit your applications, you should hit the submit button. If you experience technical issues, you can contact technical assistance at the email address listed in the RFP and on the website. Okay, this is Chris, the Senior Programs Officer. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for details on how to apply and, and, and when to apply. Um, we know not everybody heard all of that, so just to emphasize the important aspects, you must apply before the 12th of April, and the means to apply is via the website. Go to www.humanitariangrandchallenge.org, click on apply. All of the details are contained on the website. So as part of this call, we, we emailed many of you and asked you to submit your questions in advance. And we, we thank you to those who did that. And, and we have a list of common questions. It's important to say that we will not give any particular innovator any unfair advantage over the others. And so we will not assist anybody with their application. And we will not use this call to answer highly specific questions about individual proposals, but we will answer the questions that are general and useful to all, and, and certainly questions that, that come up frequently. So Patrick and I are going to go through the questions that frequently come in. The first question that we frequently get is people asking us about the country that they're applying from and if that's eligible. So I'll let Patrick answer the question of, of where we will accept applications from. Thanks, Chris. So the answer um, to people who are asking, is my, is my organization based in, in a certain country, is it eligible? The answer is that there are no geographical restrictions on applicants. Therefore, any legally formed organizations that are not subject of a USA, UK, UN Security Council, EU or World Bank sanction are eligible to apply for funding. Another question we, we often get is about refugees, and I know that somebody asked this online. So, so Patrick, the question that we often get is? So we often hear from, from applicants saying that they plan to run a program that helps refugees in a particular country, and they're asking whether this is eligible. So before I answer the question, I'll just explain a little bit of our logic here. So, I mean, the short answer is yes, the, the refugees fleeing conflict are in scope. I think it's also important to, uh, to acknowledge the plight of people who did not escape the conflict, those who are still trapped within the border. So um, what we particularly keen to fund is innovations that are suitable for helping refugees who have fled the conflict, but also that are finding a way to help internally displaced people and people who are still trapped within the conflict. So any program that has refugees in scope uh, is good, but if it can help those who are still trapped within the conflict itself, we prefer that. Okay, I'm gonna uh, ask the next question that came in. Um, and so people who have innovations um, and ideas, that have not yet been tested in conflict zones are often asking us, should they be applying for a seed grant or a transition grant? Just before I ask Patrick to give the answer, I'll just explain the difference between the two. Seed is for new ideas. 
that can attract the funding envelope of up to a quarter of a million dollars. You can apply for seed funding for up to $250,000 for new ideas. For ideas that are already proven, you can apply for up to $1 million of funding. So to go back to the question, people who have not tested their idea in a conflict zone, should they be applying for seed funding or transition to scale funding? Patrick? Yeah, so the answer for this one, the, the, the kind of core aspect of the question that, that we, we receive is that what they're talking about is an idea that has been tested and been proven, but it hasn't been tested in a conflict zone. So the answer is that in that instance, the applicant should be applying for seed funding because it hasn't got the proof of concepts needed at the transition to scale phase in the conflict zone. So in that instance, seed would be more appropriate for that innovation. Another question that we've been um, commonly receiving is regarding the focus area of energy. So we've been asked, is this restricted only to electrical power? Okay, so the answer to that question is that we're particularly interested in alternative energy solutions that are able to set up and maintain in conflict situations, provide life-saving information such as health, uh, sorry, life-saving services such as health, information, water and sanitation. Must it be electricity? No, we're open to alternatives to that. Um, and, and so the, the answer is that we're open to forms of energy that are not only electrical. Another question that comes up is how do we define the private sector? We've said earlier that we're looking for innovations that involve the private sector. Um, and so I'm gonna ask Patrick to, to give the definition of that. So broadly, we define the private sector as for-profit entities at either the local, national, or multinational level. If you have a look at section 2.6 of the RFP, we list the types of entities that we're referring to as private sector. Okay, so these are the questions that were submitted in advance. I see some of you asking questions in the chat and Natalie is, is grabbing some of them. We will not get to all of the questions um, and we particularly will not answer questions that are specific to your innovation or would give anybody a, 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 an uncompetitive edge. However, if by the end of this call, we've not answered your question, you can submit it online and you can see on the screen right now the email address, which is info at humanitariangrandchallenge Dot org. However, I'm now going to uh, tackle some of the questions that, that have come up in the past few minutes. One of them was, how many people do we normally get to apply? Well, this is actually the first time that we're doing this. And um, this is the first round of the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. And as Natalie said, next year, we will have another round. Um, other people asked how many innovations we're likely to fund. This year, we're likely to fund between 15 and 20 seed grants. That's up to a quarter of a million. And none or one or two transition grants. What I can tell you is that we do have numbers on how many people have registered on the system. To apply for the Humanitarian Grand Challenge, uh, you need to register on the system. And if you want to do that, please go to our website, click on apply. There's an online platform called Flux. It has an easy application process. There's a small number of questions with a, with a maximum character limit. It's an easy application process. And so we know how many people have registered to apply and it's just gone over about 900. Um, so there's there's been excellent interest in this and we're very pleased to see that. I hope that answers your question. There was another question that came in asking about the importance of matched funding. The, the, the idea is that we're trying to fund new ideas, ideas that will grow into something that will change the humanitarian landscape. And Invariably, that means that those ideas will need some sort of support from the private sector. And, and we encourage people, particularly those applying for transition funding, to have matched funding. However, you can see in the RFP that there's uh, a little bit of, of, of space um, between the target of 100% matched funding, which is what we expect people to get. But also, we're cognizant of small innovators and in conflict zones if you are a mechanic in Yemen, you might struggle to get matched funding for a million dollars uh, compared to, for example, an internationally known INGO in the global north. 
and so we're prepared to make to 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 consider variations from that depending on the size um, of the body that's uh, that's applying um, and their ability to raise funds. Um, we're just gonna we're just gonna see what other questions have come up. Uh, I'm gonna pass that microphone to Patrick. Thanks, Chris. So uh, I've seen a couple of questions come up um, over the chat that I'd like to, that I think are good ones to to broadcast. So um, we had one question about whether private sector partners are required at seed level, um, which is a great question. And as, as Chris laid out, it's, it's certainly a requirement at transition to scale. For seed, we're looking not necessarily to have the partners on board at, at this stage, but we're looking at whether the, the proposal has the potential to engage the private sector over the course of the funding period in order to, to onboard partners from the private sector during that time. Um, another question that, that we received is, is whether it's possible for, for two partners to submit a joint application. Um, so the answer to that is, um, you know, we welcome collaborations, but you need to select one organisation to be the lead applicant um, because uh, we need to fund one, one entity through our grant agreement. So um, if you do have a partnership and a collaboration, you should select um, the whoever is going to be the lead applicant and the, the ones that would be receiving the funds from us. Another question that often comes up is how many applications can our organisation submit? There's actually no limit. Uh, organisations are entitled to submit multiple applications, but individual project leads can only submit one. So each individual person can only be the project leads on one proposal, um, but an organization can be affiliated with multiple. So we hope that we got to all of the questions that were asked that applied to multiple people. Um, I realize we did not get to all. I would encourage you to take note of the email address on screen and if your question was not answered feel free to email us again we won't give assistance to people with the with creating applications we will not give any unfair advantage to any particular innovation uh, to any particular innovator we keep a level playing field um, but we will uh, be able to assist you if you have any problems applying or you have any general questions yes we now come to the end uh, of today's session and we thank all of you who who registered um I, I think we have almost 200 people listening to this so thank you very much for your time please take note of the email address please do take note of the deadline the 12th of april you need to register on the system a few days ahead of that don't wait till the 12th of april to start your process you have to register several days in advance and 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 thank you very much with that, uh, I will now end the call.